Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. And this is episode number 469. That's 469 of the Agostino Zynga show. How you doing? How are you feeling? Great. Amazing. Good to know. If it's your first time checking out the show, you know what to do. Smash that like, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. I'd love to know your thoughts, feelings and suggestions regarding everything I have to speak about. And of course, if you're listening to this via the podcast app, please make sure you leave me a five star review if you're listening via Apple and any other platform. Just give it a good share and that will help it to go a long way. And of course, support via patrons. Welcome to at patreon.com for just Agostino. You get all the bonus content on there for as little as one dollar for as equivalent as one pound per month you get access to all my bonus content available directly and exclusively via patreon only oh hello 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 hope you are well wherever this podcast may find you on this fine 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 evening um how am i i've been all right to be fair as you can see if you're watching via the video i probably need to trim i'm reaching that point where i'm starting to look like um I don't know. I'm starting to look semi homeless. If that's a kind of incorrect, is that a good thing to say nowadays, or do you get cancelled for saying stuff like that, or people get mad at you? It's in, you know, you can't really cancel me. I'm just a civilian. I don't really have anything of value to take away, to be honest. You know, get out the violins. But for the most part, yeah, I do kind of look a bit dishevelled. Um, I'm at that stage now where I'm having to. It's gonna hurt more. It's gonna hurt me a lot more getting ready to get the haircut than actually getting it because I'm gonna have to comb my hair out. Um, you know, I'm going to have to do all that nonsense. I have to wash it, long thing, condition it, long thing, comb it, long thing. Do you know what I mean? And then go out to the barbers and get a trim. And, you know, there's always, um, you always kind of strike fear in the heart of hairdressers whenever you pull up onto barbershops, actually. And you pull up with a flipping microphone head and they're like, oh my God, it's going to take hours. Do you know what I mean? So that's why usually I like to, when I'm at this stage, because it's not happened many times. So there was a couple of times where I kind of did the whole Jay-Z thing when I was doing a project or whatever, or I was working out and I wanted to get to a certain weight, I will just keep my head big. And then when I get to my achieved weight, I would kind of cut it off. So it's only happened a couple of times, but what I usually do to make sure that I don't get on the bad side of my my barber because you're meant to always stay on the good side of your barbers is that I'd make sure I go early in the morning so I go right at the crack of dawn my hair's combed dry no conditioner or, any, or moisturizer sorry in it or anything so nothing to get them upset um you know looking nice and fluffy and just come on just go just just put put you know drag those clippers through that afro and get me back to looking semi-normal and hopefully i do that very soon i need to do that very very soon as you can see you know the hair is looking a little bit mad but hey you know if you listen via the podcast you won't really care you won't mind so thank you for not viewing me <laughs> via the video platform i much 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 appreciate all of that what else has been happening? Not much really, right? We're meant to have obviously Freedom Week this week and that obviously got cancelled. That's been um scrapped. There is this rumour going around or, you know, these little leaks happening where some top scientists are suggesting that we can maybe bring it forward and bring it to the fifth to maybe offset some of the backlash that people, the, some of the fury that people have with the, you know, Euro, the, the Philippine Euros final going forward with basically a full crowd and to kind of offset some of that, you know, anger that the public are rightly to have, which especially myself, you know, it's a complete piss take. There is this idea that they might, the government, if they're smart, just kind of throw up the 5th of July as basically like, hey, by the way, you guys did a good job. Um, don't, you know, not vote for us in the next election. Here's the 5th of July. And then the next week, I think the following week is basically the Euros, the Euros final, if I'm not mistaken. So that could work out, but I don't really think so because all the murmurs we're hearing so far directly from the horse's mouth matt hancock and boris has been still 19 for thinking the other day there was an article that said oh yeah boris said the 19th looks like it's on so we have to wait you know basically another four weeks you know basically from the day that we we're meant to go you know whatever it is what it is isn't it there's no point in kind of crying over spilt milk but it's just annoying seeing all these other countries in europe that we were kind of ahead of slowly but surely opening up before we do you know look at spain look at Germany, look at Italy, look at France, 
like for goodness sake Paris Fashion Week is on right now do you know what I mean men's first you know um men's wear of course space is a smaller scale but still everyone's out there doing the whole like you know paris fashion jaunt and jumping around from spot to spot people are in berlin raving and you know chewing off their cheeks on high fmdma um possessions that party collective have announced a whole slew of dates through july to august most of them are sold out as well absolute beast of a promotion outfit they are in it possessions i was looking at actually trying to go but then I checked the actual location of where it is. It's not really in Paris. It's sort of like outside of Paris, like a kind of like supposedly a 30 minute drive, maybe like 45 minutes on the public transport. You have to kind of leave Paris. It's kind of like, what's it, to the east of Paris, 30 minutes out, which is pretty sick. It kind of goes with everything that they do. They have to find these kind of abandoned areas or warehouse spaces where they can kind of get a bit leery. But that might be a bit, a bit of a ropey one to kind of come back home with. And then, of course, Eurostars are like a hundred odd. So it's a bit of an expensive, you know what I mean, night out, basically. Because I was thinking of doing like a Saturday morning or Saturday afternoon and then coming back Sunday morning kind of vibe because it's on a Saturday. That might be a good thing. Interesting that they don't do it on Fridays, right? I wonder if that's like a Paris thing where they tend to just like to rave on the Fridays instead. Maybe because they want to allow most people, maybe because of... I would imagine if you work in the service industry in Paris or in France in general, because, you know, they're really about workers' rights. They probably have it where you just work kind of like a nine to five ish sort of shift. You don't do like the graveyard and crazy shifts that you do in other parts of Europe, like especially in the UK. If you work in a bar, there is no such thing as a Monday to Friday. You're working all weekends. You're working open close, which is basically what, nine until midnight, 1 a.m. So there's no chance of you having your kind of social life on a weekend. So maybe in Paris it's different where you basically, if you work in a bar or a restaurant, you still get to go home, you know, on most days by like what, latest 9 p.m., which gives everyone a chance to kind of get, you know, get their sexy clothes on and go out or their chic clothes on, as you say, if you're in Paris and France. So maybe that's a thing, but I was interested to see all the dates on Saturday. So it's just frustrating, man. Like I said, everyone else is open. We're not. We're kind of having to twiddle our thumbs and wait. And I guess the only good thing about this whole situation has been the football. The Euros has been a great distraction from all this misery because i imagine if there was no euros and then we couldn't go out or especially for myself you couldn't go out for a little dance no carnival right that got cancelled it would be a bleak summer and you'd be flipping melting indoors as i am at the moment with no air conditioning um just wanting things to be over just wanting the winter to come how weird is that right i'm in a state where i'm kind of you know it's so flipping dead out there <laughs> you kind of want the winter to come along so you can just put on your jackets and stand outside club queues and stuff for you know whoever so the euros have been a good distraction england's performance in the euros so far has been somewhat mediocre but fair enough we kind of got through clean slate top of the group no goals conceded you can't really go wrong with that all things considered but England, similar to Man United, the team that I support, it's more so the performance and less so about the results, right? You look at United finishing second in the league, you know, of course, considering how everybody kind of expected us not to finish second or not even to finish the top four, great achievement. But then considering how poorly Man City started and how strongly we started and the fact that Liverpool imploded, Chelsea were, you know, coached by a fairly mediocre manager and Frank Lampard at the time, Arsenal were doing an Arsenal it really did seem like a little bit of a letdown that we kind of didn't really take the ball by the horns and stamp a little bit more of a challenge for the title this well, this past season. And, you know, the fact that, you know, so much has been invested in the squad and still it feels like the team isn't really that great and the managers are a bit average, but we've got some special players here and there. There's kind of some correlations when it comes to it. And, and of course, just in terms of coaching ability or in terms of kind of, you know, the ability to kind of set a team up to play a certain way an expansive brand of football um football that brings out the best of the players available there is definitely some correlations between oligon social and gareth southgate i would say maybe oligon social has the benefit of having the profile of united for the past what three and a half years and um, that would definitely help him but i'd say if they both went on the kind of like open market in terms of getting a coaching job for a club team i think they'd both be in it for a big surprise as to what level they were actually at from Man united because you'd imagine if you leave United, you're probably able to go to another top team, right? Maybe a top four, top five, top six team. But I think they'd both struggle to find jobs in those kind of clubs personally, um, especially if, if the clubs are aiming to play because everyone now wants sexy football, right? Um, everyone wants kind of expansive, expressive, attacking football. And those two managers aren't necessarily your ones. But 
I still have to say, especially the previous game against Czech Republic, we kind of stumbled into this formation due to some of the suspensions or people not suspensions, uh, Mount and what's his name, Chilwell had to kind of be out because they came in contact with what's his name, um, the Scottish lad, Billy Gilmore. So that kind of forced Gareth Southgate's hand. He had to make some changes, brought Saka in, Grealish started. And I think that really worked really, really well. I think Saka, because he hasn't really been spoken about the entire time, everyone's been focusing more on Jaden Sancho and why he hasn't played and maybe Rashford. I think Saka came on with a point to prove and he played really, really well against Czech Republic, man. He was an absolute menace, um, you know, doing exactly what he did at Arsenal. So Arsenal fans aren't surprised by his level of performance, but he really did kind of stake a claim for himself as being maybe one of the first options off the bench if kind of Southgate prefers to go if he's kind of tried and true front free then maybe he's the first option off the bench but he played really well he did himself um, all the favours in terms of making sure Southgate has some problems or some issues when it comes to selecting the team um, but overall it's just a bit flat in it just a bit flat Sterling obviously popped up with the goal again another um, important player in the kind of he kind of reminds me what he does in England similar to what Russia does for United you know he can have a bit of a poor game running into players and not necessarily you know having any influence on the game and then a chance will pop up and he will either contribute an assist or he'll score a goal and that kind of makes people forget about all the other things that have happened and I just think as we've seen now you know with the Euros and some of the top teams we're all kind of starting to see especially avid watchers of the Premier League who don't watch any other league I think I've kind of been fortunate that I kind of, you know, force myself most weekends if I'm bored to just watch random leagues because I've got obviously a BT Sports um, subscription so I can watch some stuff, some Bundesliga matches, some league arm matches and then of course through the other dodgy sites you can watch other leagues. But I think people were in for a surprise. People, are, most England fans it feels like have been a little bit surprised by the level or the standard of our players compared to other nations, especially some of the nations that maybe aren't as like, you know, amazing you know Slovakia's I think second game they play some really great stuff it's forget all the big guns but I think people have kind of finally started to see that maybe a lot of these players that we think are sensational aren't really that sensational and they're just good players they're not like you know world beaters but they're really really good players and I think that's okay but it's just this idea that we have in our head that you know the likes of the Phil Foden's are going to be gazers and all this sort of stuff and it's not the same and it's unfair to expect that from these kind of players and also football's just not that way anymore now football is basically mostly a systems thing right it's mostly a who can have the best system and who basically and what kind of players do you need to basically um, fit into that system and I think some of these players once they've been taken out of it and they've kind of had to rely on their technical abilities and you know to, to just to be able to play football because obviously the pace of international football is way slower so you can't really get away with the kind of health scale of football that you get what we do in the Premier League it kind of does show up a lot of deficiencies. And I think that's what we've basically been seeing as England fans overall. I think people have started to realise, OK, we've got some great, some good, some great players, some good players. But overall, we're not like, you know, the most amazing team to watch or we're not the most like we don't have, a, you know, a lot of weapons really at our disposal. The tactics as well don't really bring out the best in the players. Because if that was me and I was England coach, I would definitely say that there is definitely a it's best definitely an unbalanced squad you would say right i think definitely you would say attacking wise that england squad is pretty decent um but when it comes to defense it's probably not the best or it's okay so if that's the case just put all your best play or the, the players who kind of fit well in that system of attack whatever you want to do and just kind of let them express themselves um that might be the best option possibly obviously some tactics here and some tactics you can kind of throw in here and there but that might be the best way to go but so far this Gareth Southgate approach has worked, kind of keeping solid. Um, obviously, you know, um, making sure you've got those two defensive midfielders in midfield, like in Calvin Phillips and Declan Rice, covering our centre-backs, which is weird considering you've got a pretty decent centre-back pairing in either Maguire, Stones, Mings, and who else, and Ben White. They're all fairly decent. None of them are, you know, super crap. They're all pretty okay. I'm not really nervous about either of them kind of like, you know, one-on-one -on -one with any player, to be honest, you know. Um, it's a bit of a weird one. But overall, hey, um, next round on Tuesday, England facing Germany. That's going to be a big test, of course. Um, eager to see what happens there. 
not feeling too optimistic especially considering how you know germany kind of put themselves through a very hard fought two one um victory against hungary last minute kind of um winner from leon goretzka right towards the end so they've definitely got their tails up or maybe they might be a bit tired who knows but you know england against Wales at wembley there's always kind of tears for england fans for the most part so i'm not feeling optimistic about that but you never know stranger things have happened this england side could go on to kind of be one of those weirdly oddly functional kind of england squads right it just kind of gets the job done so let's see what goes on in the round of 16 coming up <clears throat> then we had this pretty interesting odd um news as courtesy of majesty evening news um yours marina has some kind of um in interesting words to say about um, Bruno Fernandes and his impact for Portugal obviously Portugal have gone through now this is a recording just, uh, just after they drew 2-2 with France and Bruno Fernandes came on for the last 20 minutes and had an absolute disaster class I think he you know miscontrolled a couple of passes a couple of passes yeah uh, misplaced a couple as well um, was just generally off the pace and then he nearly gave away a penalty right at the end which might have put Portugal out which is insane to think about, but hey, let's continue. There's an article from the other day and it says, former Manchester United bosses Mourinho is hopeful that Bruno Fernandes will perform against France tomorrow. Uh, obviously, he's played. He said, defending champions France. Da, da, da. So this is Mourinho's comments. He says the following. He says, I hope he turns up against France. He's a player with incredible potential. He can pass, he can score, he can get penalties and score. He can score three kicks too. Just Mourinho to talk sport. He said, he has a lot to give, but the reality is in these two matches, he has not been there. Portugal has three fantastic attacking players, but Silva, Cristiano Ronaldo, and Diego Jota. They, these are three very good players. We need a connection until now. Bruno is not playing, which is true. Bruno has been very poor in the Euro so far, and I think a lot of kind of a lot of people who aren't necessarily sold on him, myself included. I think I've said in a few places that I've always thought Bruno could. I've always thought the way people view Bruno isn't necessarily what he's actually good at. I think on paper maybe on paper in terms of numbers it may seem like he's a number 10 but i think his best position is definitely as a number eight in terms of a box-to-box -box sort of kind of midfielder um but then again he would need other players around him two very good technical um you know composed players on the ball that can resist the press i can kind of get the ball out to him so he can do his little you know one touch passes over the top or not maybe but as playing as a conventional number 10 in the like in the kind of vein as a, as a deco you know kind of loitering or quite or you know or philip cortina when he was at liverpool that's just not him he doesn't have the dribbling ability or the close control to make that work um he doesn't necessarily have the pace you know across a short distance either to kind of get away from defenders the cuteness to kind of cut across but he does have a fairly good shot on him he does have a pass he can find a pass um and he's brave kind of taking them i think he's that's a good thing about him you can say too he doesn't necessarily hide even when he's not playing well he always kind of shows for the ball but this idea that he is Cantona or that he is this kind of midfield maverick it just isn't the case and i think we've gone to see it now like he's kind of been exposed a little bit um during the euros and he's been anonymous for the most part he has you know just not really played that well impacted the games at all that well and the last two games every time he's kind of come off a sub John martino has kind of um replaced him obviously the guy from wolves and he's done fairly well and so well that he obviously started a game against france um the other day so it's been interesting to see and i think we're now in a position i don't know why it is with united fans where people are more fans of the players in the club so people will kind of go hell for leather on the player and want to down the hill and defend him whether it's a pogba or rashford or Martial, it's just bizarre everyone has got this sort of like um what's your thing called this obsessive thing this sort of like fanboy thing when it comes to the players i never really understood it don't get me wrong i've loved the players i play for my club but I want the club to do well and I'm just going to be objective about all the players that play for us and I think Chris Bruno Fernandes is great you know his impact obviously has um it can't go unnoticed I think without him it's definitely safe to say we probably wouldn't have finished second but this idea that he is a number 10 just isn't true he doesn't play like a number 10 for United he's obviously like a second striker for the most part he doesn't necessarily play that well in that position conventionally if he is on the ball he doesn't play that position either for Portugal and that's just not going to bring the best out of him I think the best out of him is going to be in the midfield three as a number eight you know in that sort of role kind of like you know latching onto balls outside the box for a shot um, again he sort of reminds me of Manish in that way 
probably not the maybe Manisha has probably a better technical ability than him in terms of like close control um dribbling past players but that kind of like you know he was that auxiliary person that just kind of latched onto the balls outside the area or maybe was able to pick up balls semi deep and spray them around and all that stuff like the, the, and kind of make late runs into the box that's the kind of player I, I'd imagine um Bruno Fernandes to be less so than a Deco in that regard obviously Deco is a bit of a unicorn by the way that he played but still that's what a number 10 is to me like a Pablo Aymar and those kind of type plays even like an Eden Hazard is more of a number 10 than a Bruno Fernandes you know that low center of gravity that ability to kind of like jink past a couple of players find a killer ball um he definitely doesn't have that and he's definitely been exposed so far in the Euros and again it's another example of just you know how European football international football in general has a tendency of kind of exp realize making you realize how good certain people are and how maybe overrated some people are which is okay it's fine you know i mean it's not a bad thing i just think it's kind of fair it's kind of obvious to see and if you kind of deny it you kind of you know you're kind of being blind to the fact really in my point or from my experience anyway but hey what do i know then we have this um this is a <laughs> this is random and doesn't really add anything I don't know why I'm coming to this because it's a bit, you know, it's bullshit. But hey, you know, it's a podcast. It's the whole point of a podcast is to talk absolute BS. So this is courtesy of Hypebeast. And this is an article says the following. Toyota taps into the skateboarding community for latest project, right? And it's a bunch of kids. And it's a fairly innocuous kind of, you know, um, promotion advertising that Toyota are trying to do in order to kind of align themselves with the millennial market. You've got Nike, SB, Insignia, they sprayed on the floor. And it says, having launched a collaborative collection, this is from Hypebeast, um, it says, yeah, having launched a collaborative collection comprising of a selection of garments and exclusive beer break figure last year, Toyota enlist Japanese multimedia agency Starbase Inc. once again to introduce the fourth installment of the Play Hi Hiichi Hi 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 Ace Play Hi Ace series, brought to life by New York based for, uh, forefront film photographer Jiro Konami. The campaign channels youthfulness, staying true to its drive, your teenager's dreams ethos. Shot in a car manufacturer's home city of Tokyo, Konami captures three emerging skaters. You got their names there as they do what they do best. Set in the backdrop of the customized matte black Toyota High Ace, the skaters' board of choice's original Toyota deck as they don the latest collection of hoodies. So they're, they're, they're on Toyota hoodies. They're wearing Toyota hoodies, riding on Toyota decks, ollieing in front of a Toyota pickup truck. And it's just, I don't know. There was a time, like I mentioned, I think on Twitter the other day, there was a time when I was growing up, right? When I was trying to get into skateboarding as a young kid from the ends. I must have been like 14, 15 or something, skating around my area on a crappy deck that I bought from like Sports Direct or something. And then I decided, and I kind of finally got into like digging a bit deeper. I started reading Sidewalk magazine and some other one. I forgot, was it called Front or something? I forgot a couple of UK magazines that don't really exist anymore. And then it kind of got me into discovering skater owned shops and all that. And, you know, going to a couple. And then, of course, I kind of landed in sam city skates the one in covent garden and i remember those guys being such cunts when i walked in there for the first time i must have been like what 14 15 um just open giddy you know uh, wide-eyed giddy and just wanting to get involved right like this whole you know i think that's what I've, i probably watched kids around for then for the first time the seminal larry clark film and that just got me engrossed in everything i was obsessed with new york was obsessed with supreme zoo york um, you know, all this flipping, you know, super eight footage of people skating, Gino Iannucci, Iannucci, however you pronounce his name. Um, just obsessed with that, right? That was that whole area that kind of, um, I kind of got bit by the skating bug, bug sorry. And obviously you're going to time City Skate thinking you're going to be received with open arms and they're going to welcome you in and kind of show you the way. And it's just instant vibe out. And of course, I then learned via forums like Slap Magazine, like slap and sidewalk again um that that's just a standard kind of you know rite of passage in skate sh in a skate kind of scene you kind of get vibed out so they want to see if you're really about this life if you're in there for the right intentions which is fine cool then i had to kind of earn my stripes go to a couple of events hang out do the do the damn thing and you know you finally feel like okay they've accepted me for the most part but i still didn't give a shit i still kind of did my own vibe i just go to skate back my own didn't really do the whole crew thing and then Little by little, as the years progressed and skateboarding has now become this commercial, commoditized, you know, shell of a thing, right? It's kind of ripped all the essence away from it, especially some of this bullshit. 
you're seeing a lot more of these kind of skater owned stores a lot more of these kind of core true to the scene you know hardcore skate rat type people endorsing this sort of stuff because obviously it's a paycheck right they're gonna put some money in the back of your pocket allow you to kind of maybe pursue your other projects then you have the fashion aspect of it like all those palace wankers posing in fucking vogue right like you know laughing around as working class with their sovereign rings on dirty shoes and shit when they're really from affluent families it's all a nonsense and that's completely okay, right? No one really bats an eyelid at it because the the right people are involved in all that sort of stuff. You've got the Louis Vuitton skate shoe revolution. That's complete bullshit as well, right? That kind of goes against everything that skateboarding is built upon. And no one really bats an eyelid because there's the right people involved and they're friends or something. It's just like, it's just annoying, right? Like, how did I get such a rough time coming into the thing? being so innocent and just wanting to get involved and then all this stuff happens and everyone kind of turns a bland eye and it's okay it's just annoying there were, and again there was a time back in the day right where some skate shops especially in london or especially in the uk for the most part they were so against the idea of stocking skate um, and nike sbs and they just did it kind of begrudgingly they still did it by the way but they kind of acted like they didn't want to do it that they would have these weird challenges where they'd kind of force you not force you but there was an option to do a kickflip um, outside of the store in the shoes you just bought in order to get a discount or something i think i think slams his case used to do it too um i don't know if that was a way to kind of for you to do a performative act to make you legitimate legitimate in their eyes or if it was just like a little fun in-house joke thing but i always found that stuff a little bit demeaning right but again maybe it had some kind of purpose behind it in order to kind of maintain the integrity of skateboarding cool do your thing but then now look what's happened fast forward to now skate shops around the you know country are kind of falling over themselves to get nike accounts only for their nike to kind of you know mess them up um and kind of force them to, to stock loads of other shoes that they don't want because for the most part all they want is a limited edition shoes obviously to make sure they get some foot flow into their shop in the hopes that maybe they can hang on to a couple of hype beast but then if i rewind the clock back again when i was going back there and i was working for hype beast right doing some photography and writing some flipping articles when i was like 1918 i went there to do some like article that I was doing about street style and the way that guy spoke to me about it, like he was kind of sunning me, right? He kind of told me to kind of basically fuck off. And now they kind of fall over themselves to get stuff written up in these kind of online fashion magazines and things just completely turned. It's just completely turned around. Like, and it's just so annoying to see from the outside. And again, I'm not the one, these people to kind of flow the whole race thing around because I'm sure there are other people who have had far better experiences than I have, but there must be something about like, you know, I don't know. There must be something in it. There really does. Cause I just don't understand. Like, again, I didn't, and again, I didn't speak to anybody back then. I was just kind of 15, just hanging on my own, just, you know, with my camera and my shitty skateboard walking around to all these things and these sort of like, you know, meets or, or these sort of, what, what are they called when they would go to flipping that Bethnal Green skate park and just, they do, they do demos and stuff. I just be there on my ones, just hanging around, just chilling, watching everybody and stuff and just soaking it all in. And I'd still get vibed out. I'd be like, okay, maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm the problem here, but I don't know, man. I'm happy to see the kids having opportunity to kind of make money like this, right? Get a Toyota kind of check in the back pocket, get Nike sponsorships. And, you know, there's brands falling over themselves to find the next hot young thing on Instagram that they can kind of sponsor and flow stuff to and build up their brand. I'm happy for them. But in terms of some of the old fuddy duds that were around when I was younger who were kind of gatekeeping the, the skateboarding and making it, you know super difficult for someone like me from ends to kind of get involved you can go fuck yourself do you know what i mean definitely go fuck yourself a lot of these guys are probably bankrupt and out of jobs and shit fair so that's probably the common resolution that they need but imagine imagine back in the day trying to flip and vibe out people that are actually trying to get into it for the love and then now you know they can't turn away the kids because the kids are the only people keeping this thing alive you know what i mean no one's gonna be paying to see some 40 year old man you know skating in i don't know you know what i mean but yeah, it's just annoying. It just it just pisses me off, I swear to God. No one bets an island. No one says a word because, you know, everyone kind of needs to get paid, I guess. Everyone needs to get paid. What else do we have here? Oh, we have this kind of, this is a funny article. This is courtesy of BBC News. Um, this is courtesy, and the headlines reads the following. If you can eat out, 
you can go to the office, says bank boss of Morgan Stanley, right? A pretty frank and um, quite funny statement there. Let's hear what he has to say. Morgan Stanley chief executive James Gorman said, if you can go into restaurants in New York City, you can come into the office. Speaking at a conference, Mr. Gorman said that he would be very disappointed if US-based workers had not returned by September. It comes as a number of banks have been have taken a tough position on home working. Jamie Dimon, the boss of the America's largest bank, JP Morgan, recently said he wanted US staff back in the office from July. Meanwhile, Goldman Sachs bankers were instructed to report to their vaccine statuses um, ahead of returning to their desk this week. And I'm not surprised to be honest. Like I said, I think I mentioned a few times in this podcast, like I was very staunchly against the whole idea of working in offices and, you know, being forced to work a particular set rotor and all this stuff. I was had some very radical views about work in general. Most of it came from my own frustration of being unable to kind of work out something that I can do that doesn't involve being employed, right? To do my own thing. Cause I think that does happen quite often. People will end up getting jobs just because they want to pay the bills. But then there's this other thing that you really want to do, but you don't really know how to do it in order to, you know, don't know how to do it at, at like a professional level that will pay you. So then sometimes you act out and take out your frustrations in your workplace. So you might be rude to people, cutty and just a bad vibe. And I've always kind of hated that element that can sometimes you know be bubbling deep inside of me and i've tried to kind of supplement that and kind of offset it by doing loads of things outside which is kind of outside of work sorry which is you know involves the djing which involves the photography involves traveling all that sort of stuff just to kind of make sure that i'm not feeling as if like my whole entire day week month year is being kind of taken over by work because it could easily happen especially if you are a perfectionist and you want to do a good job you can easily get to a point where you're kind of staying in work you know really late every single day putting in the extra hours so you can do perform but then you're also disgruntled because you're not doing the thing you actually want to do blah de, blah 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 so that can happen sometimes but i've also realized that over the last few months obviously with covid and stuff that there are some workplaces or some people that just generally do need to have that kind of camaraderie or that sort of like team spirit thing whatever it may be or that kind of magic that you get from walking into work after you know a really crazy weekend on a monday people some people do need it they generally do need that and i remember at the beginning of the lockdown there was this video from the bbc that i might feature on this podcast that featured these people english people specifically who were talking about how much they missed not being in the office and i remember laughing at it and thinking oh this is pathetic why would you miss talking to people at a coffee machine who gives a shit but you forget how much that kind of those little things actually add to your overall enjoyment of life and i think we've kind of seen especially with lockdown that when people take away things that you probably took for granted it does make you kind of it does put you in a funk a funk that you probably weren't expecting to be in especially when you consider the only things that you basically might have done when the world was reopened was go to work get a coffee go to the pub couple of holidays you know what i mean there wasn't much on your list but those things still did do a lot for your overall mental health you know the little cheeky chat you had with somebody in your flight sense or the ticket inspector guy or whatever right those things kind of add overall to it so taking away work in the office which is kind of a huge part of people's day right some people work eight hours per week which is a lot of hours per week per, eight hours per day sorry which is a lot of hours per week we add a lot of hours again per month it takes you know you need to replace it with something else and i don't think remote working so far has kind of done it for the most part it really hasn't and certain sectors too it just might be beneficial to have people in work in in the office sorry and i think having watched that um what was that flipping tv series that came on bbc about the stockbrokers and stuff in finance obviously it's a tv series don't get me wrong and it was a super accurate but there is this idea that kind of you know just standing on your desk and banging stuff and talking to a loudspeaker and whatever it may be there is something about that collective atmosphere that kind of helps to kind of push people and to do their best and to kind of bring their a-game to work every single day and i don't think you can get that remotely through zoom or whatnot so it's no surprise that some ceos are a bit hesitant to kind of allow people to work from home remotely across the board obviously if you're working for a startup and you're doing social media management and stuff that i was doing and community management you probably don't need to be in or the office too often but still maybe in terms of just the overall vibe of the work of kind of your office it might be beneficial maybe to have people come in every friday for an all hands or whatever i don't know there is a definitely a mix there so i'm a little bit more sympathetic to this idea um but i still think it's a little bit 
forcing people to come back is the one that's a bit strong for me because you know having people's kind of priorities in life have changed and it's not really going to go down well when you're kind of ham you know kind of forcing people to do um to kind of abide by your schedule i don't think that's necessarily going to go people's kind of ideas of what they deem to be a good life has definitely drastically changed over these last what 15 plus months and i don't think it's ever going to change back again to how it was before so it just might have to be a thing where like certain people who enjoy being in the office are can, can come back the people that don't can stay out and then you just take it from there really but forcing everybody across the board is a bit excessive it's, it continues here it says um mr Moore gorman said on monday that morgan stanley is yet is yet setting is not yet saying a minimum number of days that uf staff will be required to be on site but he cautioned that many that may change if employees don't return by labor day he said make no mistake about it we do our work inside morgan stanley office and that's where we teach that's where our interns learn and that's how we develop people he added that during the pandemic the bank's operations have become more flexible but he's hesitant of the idea of employees working out of state if you want to get paid new york rates you have you work in new york which is fair enough um he did not point out however in areas where coronavirus infection rates remain high such as india staff are not expected to return about nine in ten Morgan Stanley employees working on site had been vaccinated. Morgan said, having paired with the healthcare firm to offer jabs on site. So, they're doing everything to get you back in your office, basically. Free jabs and all that. Giant tech giants such as Apple and Google have been recently reversed the pandemic working conditions, telling staff to return to the office in the next few months. Oh, really? Okay. So, they've changed because they will. They, I think it's Facebook that said permanently. Is it Facebook or is it. Was it Salesforce? One of those big companies said they're going to permanently have people working from home if they wanted to. And if you want to work from the office, you can. Obviously, for companies, it's good. You can save on the retail space, on the monthly bills and rent and whatnot. But then I guess there is something still about having that. There is something in the idea of having that kind of head office hq building thing that you can kind of point to that people can kind of see hold meetings in impress investors when you're down for money and all that you know it says here last thursday amazon also told employees they're expected to work in office at least three days per week which is fair with specific days to be decided on leadership teams employees in the uk and us and other countries are expected to begin and honestly me, me personally um i think this is a win for us uh, for employees in general people that are employed right um it's definitely a win because I think there was a period in time, especially the places I've worked in, where working from home was a real privilege. It kind of is a thing that you kind of had the ox tiptoeing around. You kind of had to request it after you had a really good week or something, right? It wasn't something that was kind of given out freely. Um, and it was something that people kind of looked at, you know, would you at, at you, you know, at the corner of their eye, if you took too many days off, or, no, if you worked from home too often, too many days, that's a fraudulent slip there. But anyway, um, I think it's definitely a win that now as a society, the idea of remote working is not taboo. And I think for people that have kids, for people that have, you know, extra family members they look after or people that just have other commitments and maybe need that flexibility, it's good to have. It definitely is, especially people that don't want to give up the idea of, because some people would say, oh, just work part time. But then why would you want to give up that sort of money if you can just balance both things? And that's more than fair. And if again, if you're able to perform, because that's the, that should be the main criteria. If you can perform at a high level and you hit your KPIs and you exceed your targets and everyone seems to like you and you're kind of an integral part of the team, I don't really see why it should matter where you really work overall. I understand there is a bigger question to be had about the overall harmony of a company um, with everyone working remotely, for sure. Um, maybe we have to move how we kind of, you know, th there is something in it for sure, collectively being in one place. But in terms of certain individuals, because again, I don't think our whole entire workforce is ever going to want to work from home completely. There's definitely going to be a segment of the workforce that would want to work in the office. Let them have the option and let the rest do what they want to do. Um, I think that's the best option going forward personally. But that's just what I think, isn't it? That's just what I think. Next on the list here, what else do we have? We have this courtesy of Enemy. Lord, she's back. Lord is back. Said Lord, praise for dropping CDs and offering discless versions of a new album. Don't get me wrong, the new Lord single that's out at the moment is a bit shit. Don't get me wrong, it does sound like a little bit of a weird, um, uh, 
you know regen remix of a flipping george michael record everyone's kind of said that it obviously does um the video is pretty interesting you know it's pretty whitewash which is quite cool that she didn't try kind of tick the diversity boxes and make it look like a united colors of benetton ad it's just people that she kind of thought would look good in the video kind of looks like a mid what's that movie called midsummer yeah midsummer whatever it's called the a24 um production company put together had that kind of vibe she obviously looks really good she looks fit as fit as a fiddle her midsection was tighter than tight um you can tell she's been working out during you know lockdown or abstaining from eating certain things and doing some crunches whatever that she may be or some burpees so she looks in really good shape um but yeah the music itself was a bit of a letdown and i'm a little bit of a newly converted lord fan um I saw her when 2017, I think Primavera, I think so, at the 2017, I don't know when then, and I'd never obviously seen her live. Obviously, heard a couple of her records here and there, but didn't really pay too much close attention to her. And then she absolutely destroyed it at um, Primavera. Like she's really good live. And I take, maybe I'm in the minority here, but I'm one of those people who kind of puts a lot of stock in the quality of performance of an artist when they're performing live as opposed to just what they do on this album i think you know some of the especially the higher echelon artists like a lord who has a big you know she's signed to a label you have a lot of money put in put in you people kind of you know think you're a big pop star which obviously she is or an indie or whatever she is right um people like that generally do get to work in some of the best studios they get some of the best people to mix down and master their records so more often than not it's always going to sound lush you're never going to hear a record from you know um flipping you know people like her fewer bridges and stuff that isn't going to sound good right quality wise but is the music going to be good when you actually hear them perform it live and usually a lot of these people are kind of let down to, but Lord was really good live, man. What a performance, the dancing, the dancers, the lighting, the outfit changes, really, really impressive. I was really impressed by it. And ever since then, I've kind of kept my eye on her. And, you know, she's been a bit silent ever since. I think her last album might have been 2017 or something, really late, really long, long, long time. So for her to come back now and decide to do like a special release where she's not going to be selling CDs, which I've, no, don't really have a problem with i think the idea of selling cds nowadays is so antiquated especially when i don't know if kids even have cd players now if they're the ones mostly buying music i don't know if anyone has a cd player even most you know kind of modern cars now don't have cd players they just have um units that you can plug your phone in or you can listen to like kind of um digital radio stations and whatnot so i decided that she's kind of decided to put away with cds and put it in this little box that's a little bit bespoke for her fans i think it's cool some people are obviously being cynical about it and saying oh you're just replacing one waste with another bit of waste with loads of bits of paper but there's probably far less damage done to the environment by recycling bits of paper than trying to recycle or trying to you know throw a bunch of cds that no one's going to be using in a few years point blank into some landfill but anyway it's continue with the article says the following Lord has been praised for her environmental concerns after she confirmed that her new album, Solar Power, would not release a CD. Um, the latest record from the New Zealand single will arrive on August 20th following the release of the opinion of single. Um, while the record will receive a limited vinyl release, the singer has confirmed that a CD release will be dropped in favour of a high quality download, which I definitely agree with, especially now that Apple introduced that new spatial listing thingy whatever they introduced obviously tidal has really high quality um audio files i think they might have waves or something even maybe higher than that so a lot of these platforms are understanding that there is a sort of weird I wouldn't say audio file community but whether the community that exists that likes like hd cdq quote unquote quality music and they're willing to pay for it too so if they can kind of capitalize on that and obviously do away with the cds that's going to kill two birds with one stone so i definitely feel that it's as here as an eco-conscious music box will be available to purchase an alternative to a cd this innovative offering will contain extra visuals to content handwritten notes exclusive photos and a download card the card will be given uh, to purchasers a high quality download to the music two exclusive bonus tracks that access to some special surprise along the way so it contains everything that you would want from an album that's part of the beauty of owning albums back in the day even records right is the idea of kind of reading the sleeve seeing all the credits taking out the inserts reading you know checking out the little zine or book or booklet they put in with some of the pictures or maybe that took place during the recording of the album things that you haven't seen on the internet that was always kind of great to see and then kind of picking out stuff in there and you know what what equipment they're using who was in the room 
room, all that stuff is really cool. And maybe there's going to be more owners put on it because it's going to come in a box, right? Instead of a CD pack thing. And it's going to be more options to kind of share that online too. So it's a clever idea. I, I really like it. It says it continues. Um, when talking about the concept, Lord said, I decided early on the process of making this album that I wanted to create an environmentally kind, forward thinking alternative to the CD. Um, I wanted this music box product to be similar to in size, shape and price of CD, to live alongside it in a retail environment, but be something which stands apart that's committed to involving nature of a modern album. So it's going to look like a CD, but it's just not going to have a CD in it, fair? Um, she has now been praised by the music declare, um, declares emergency, which focuses on environmental impact. It says, yes, Lord, at Lord. Lord's releasing her new album. It tweets here in a new plastic-free format. The music box that provides high-quality download bonus tracks and exclusive material 100% biodegradable card they wrote praising the move one fan said i've been buying them for 30 odd years but this is definitely the way forward okay cool so good to know man um so big up lord um hopefully we see this very soon i can't wait for the album i think again the single's been a bit a bit of a letdown but i think lord is definitely more of an album artist anyway so i'm eager to listen to that album from front to back when it does drop solar power coming to your head top very soon Next, we got this article here, courtesy of the New York Times about boys wearing summer dresses. And it doesn't make sense to me. Obviously, there is a some sort, there is a trend obviously going on at the moment, right? This need to kind of put men or to allow men to kind of put no varnish on, wear makeup, um, wigs, you know, kind of more feminine out, more feminine, you would say, kind of clothes, whether it comes to whether it's skirts, dresses, um, certain lapels on jackets, the way trousers fit, crop tops, blah, 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 blah. There's definitely something going on out there, right? But I think the reason that I find it a little bit, you know, cringe is the fact that it's kind of forced and it doesn't feel of it doesn't feel congruent to the people who are wearing it. I think this guy's image here, this kind of cover image, definitely does feel like somebody that would wear a dress day to day. It just feels like something a bit natural. But I'd say the Kid Cudi off white dress that he wore for was it on Jimmy Fallon or whatever? That looked like a bit of a forced thing. Obviously it was a tribute to Kurt Cobain, but it just didn't look like something that felt comfortable, looked comfortable, looked chic. It didn't really kind of, you know, look badass in a way that kind of makes any sense it just looked a little bit performative and i think the issue in general obviously this is going to be mostly a conversation that kind of skews mostly towards the kind of um queer side of things i would imagine but i say the most problematic thing about this especially for straight dudes would be the fact that there's no way to make there's no way in a there's no way you can wear a dress and have it somehow be appealing to women that you want to fuck it's just not going to happen in it i would imagine for the most part like girls don't necessarily would necessarily be into a dude that wants to wear dresses because it's not necessarily they're not necessarily sending them the right signals it only kind of works within a quote-unquote queer environment or a sort of more of an alternative um outlook on life kind of environment i would imagine um but again i just feel like some of the celebrities that they've been placing stresses and some of the some of that stuff just feels a little bit forced it feels a little bit calculated and it just loses a bit of the magic right part of the appeal of wearing a dress is the shock factor is the um is just the jarring nature of the kind of you know seeing somebody that's obviously pretty broad and stocky looking you know the beard the tattoos and whatnot the kind of just the, you know the uh, the prehistoric caveman nature of a straight dude wearing a dress kind of just is really appealing and has some validity and weight to it but once you start adding all these sort of weird things and codes and then you try to make it into like a political statement and it's an empowering thing it loses any of its magic it just becomes another performative exercise in my opinion personally um and this again coming from somebody that's a big david bowie fan right coming from somebody that's a very big iggy pop fan i just feel as if like it just doesn't have the same sort of oomph behind it it just feels a little bit like do you know what i mean it's not really that impressive you know what i mean it's not really that impressive it's not really that interesting um and it just feels a little bit try hard but anyways continue the article it's courtesy of new york times boys in their summer dresses written by guy trebe it says it seems fairly unlikely that when Irwin Shaw wrote The Girls in Their Summer Dresses, his classic uh, pion to the million of wonderful women around the world, drifting along the pavement as warm breezes tugged at their hems, he could have envisioned a day when those girls would be likely men. 
sexist dated and as shows um, much antagonized sorry anthropologized 1939 story may be it did lay out the truths about the urban existence and the unalloyed joy of looking those pleasures largely withheld over the last 16 months have returned as we venture from for our caves so delighted surprise of le the least one observer a considerable amount of number of us apparently used the time in confinement to rethink some of our shibotlets having that what that word means about who gets to wear what koa sinclair for instance treated lockdown as a time to experimentation a chance to push a style already liberated from the rigid binary conventions of the realm of next level femininity so there's so there's mx sinclair 26 on a recent warm afternoon sauntering through domino park in williamsburg brooklyn um slick four locked fur four locked curled in an enemy flipped inked arms emerging from the sleeves of a sinuous isi miyaki pleated dress i guess it's this person here right that isi miyaki dress will probably look pretty deep on a dude i'm not gonna lie um for the longest time people were stuck on being one way or another mx sinclair said referring to a waning gender dress codes queer people have been playing with this for a long time but now you see a lot of guys in dresses that don't identify as always feminine i don't necessarily see that i don't think that's true i've never really seen a lot of guys in dresses like my barometer for just what regular guys are into is shortage high street I don't think I'm there. I don't think I will see a guy on Shoreditch High Street on the pole wearing a dress. If I do, it's going to be a, you know, a dab. I'm going to dab the guy and definitely give him a little high five from afar or from up close or clap or whatever and let him know that he's a boss. But it's very unlikely that you're going to see a, you know, a quasi cis um, heterosexual male, wherever that term is, right? Um, donning a dress. It just doesn't make any sense for the most part, unless there's some sort of artist or something. I just don't see it happening. It continues here, it says, you see um, Hip Hop MC and Taste Mega Asap Rocky clad in a Vivian Westwood kilt, which looked really good, uh, in my opinion. On the cover, latest GQ, you see Madonna's 15 year old soccer player's son, David Banda, gliding down a long highway. Hallway saw in a viral video while dressed in a white skirt silk left no while dressed in a white silk floor length my couture number that he says is so refreeing you see a wave of male teachers in spain come to school wearing skirts to support students expelled from class and forced to seek counseling after wearing one you spot little nas x in the tonight show in a long tartan skirt and manly symbol in scotland though a few places and bad bunny and the grammys in a burberry coat worn over a classic black ricardo tissue tunic resembling a nun's habit you observe on a recent blam and again these people aren't really great examples are in it they're all rock stars and artists in their own mark who kind of get to you know live in a world kind of far away from where we are living they get to live in a reality that they get to construct and you get to do what you want to do basically everything that you do kind of gets excused or explained away in some viral tweet somewhere it continues says the observer on recent blammy on a recent balmy afternoon in washington square park guys dressed v variously in tattered frock reminiscence of the kurt cobain 993 cover of the face a plaid britney spears um schoolgirl mini a cap um sleeve blouse and skirt set also from Isi Miyake, accessorized with black ankle socks and patent leather slug shoes. Um, I started out wearing feminine tops and then feminine boots, says Robert Sal Suludas, a 24-year-old anesthetician who grew up picking coffee beans on a farm in Hawaii, said of his Isi Miyake outfit. Now, honestly, I just shop in women's departments. Yeah, if you've got the size and you're comfortable with that sort of stuff, fair enough, but I don't know, man. I don't know. I just think it's a little bit, you know, it's a little bit of a reach. I think most dudes, for the most part, are probably not going to be wearing a, a again, a Kid Cudi dress anytime soon. I just don't think it looks that interesting on Kid Cudi. I think it, I think I've seen Lil Nas X in much better outfits than this. Personally, I also don't think that's interesting. And maybe it might move the needle in media, but I don't think culturally it really moves the needle on the streets. I think if people are comfortable to do such like this, they will end up doing it eventually of their own regard. But I don't, again, I just don't see where the appeal or where the need, because I think a lot of dudes, I've mentioned it before, when it comes to fashion, mostly, maybe that's why I've always kind of thought of my, thought fashion is more so, for men, for the most part, is mostly a style thing and less so a quasi fashion, fashion thing where you just wear stuff for the sake of wearing it. Most dudes are wearing those massive Joe Budden hats, weren't wearing them because they thought they looked cool. They worn them because most girls probably like those hats too, right? They compliment your hat. So if you're after, you know, if, if you want to hook up with girls randomly, you know, 
on numerous nights, the best thing to do is kind of to peacock and to wear things that girls would kind of be interested in trinkets, whether it's flipping wristbands or, you know, bracelets, rings, tattoos, whatever it can need it, you'll do it. So a lot of the stylistic choices of dudes is mostly informed by, you know, whether or not other girls are going to want to fuck them if they wear those things for lack of a better term. And until dresses and skirts occupy that kind of level, they're never really going to be taken up by straight guys, I think. Obviously, the queer side of things is far more interesting. You can be a little bit more free. You can explore different things. You can kind of bend and twist the norms and conventions. And you can kind of blur the lines a little bit more freer. But again, that's the benefit of being queer. You get to kind of dabble and kind of experiment and be okay with that sort of stuff. And no one really questions you or takes a piss for the most part. But when you're a straight guy, it's a little bit difficult it's a little bit more difficult but again maybe i'm wrong in that regard let me know what you think in the comments down below next on list we've got here courtesy of the verge interesting news it says here spotify's clubhouse competitor green room launches today i will again and i've made my thoughts very clear about clubhouse i think it's a bit of a bullshit app obviously overvalued they probably are kicking themselves for not accepting that crazy build multi-billion dollars it multi or singular it might have been a four billion whatever it was there's a lot of billions um offer that they got from i think facebook or somebody i don't know who it was and then that company went and went on and made their own now twitter have got their own clubhouse version of an app facebook have got their own version now spotify went to the chat so uh, you know these platforms have already got built-in audiences they've already got a reason why that kind of app would work on their platform and it's only a matter of time before they just take away all or siphon away some of the viewers and users from um, clubhouse onto those apps and since clubhouse is still invite only i'm not too sure I, I did see some news clipping that said it was going to soon open up to everybody but if it still remains open um invite only and all these other platforms are opening up for free to everybody it's just going to be over before it started for those guys or you never know it might end up like snapchat snapchat has been people have been predicting the death of snapchat every every other year and they still keep trucking on so maybe they might figure out something and because they were first to market people just always going to associate that sort of like audio um chat room sort of stuff with clubhouse so that might be a good thing who knows but let's continue with the article it says here spotify's live audio app green room formally launched today on ios and android marking the company's first real attempt at creating a social media platform hmm they think it's a social media platform. Okay. So I'd assume the long-term goal is to maybe pull it away from Spotify and have it live as its own app. Hmm. The social, the social audio app, which is similar to Clubhouse, allows users to host live conversations about sports, music, and culture. Today's launch um, doesn't come with a, a marquee creator announcement, which is very interesting, or Pacific event plan. But instead, the company is taking the opportunity to encourage people to sign up and figure out how they want to use the app. Some of its core functionality, a person close to the situation says, will eventually make its way to the actual Spotify app, so the team will monitor what happens in the green room. So that's an interesting way to go about things. They didn't launch it with some glitch see you know celebrity um host or you know rooms or discussions they just said hey here it is it's open use it you know to your heart's content let us know how and what works and what doesn't and then they're going to implement what they like on the spotify app itself really interesting the app is built on locker room which betty labs created and spotify acquired in march great acquisition the app focused solely on sports content so users who've been logged on since the start will have to get used to seeing more than just sports talk which is likely the biggest change other noticeable changes on the app are likely are mostly visual it has now a spotify green and black color scheme as well as a new logo font functionality wise it also now features native recording which will allow users to save their shows and distribute them as podcasts of course Spotify owns anchor so one can easily imagine those shows eventually natively landing or moved to create software for further editing publishing sick users can sign up for Spotify login Although it's not required to use the app, the initial sign-up flow will allow users to select their interests from a wide range of topics like music genres and sports teams. Additionally, Spotify is announcing a creator hunt, a creator fund. Sorry, although details are sparse, people on the app will be paid based on how popular their rooms are and their engagement in them. The source closest the situation says the exclusive deals with creators are also in the works. With announcements likely to come over the summer, it isn't clear how much money Spotify will dedicate to lure creators on the app, but interested users can sign up for more information below here um yeah 
See, so yeah, every app has now seems to have a social media app, Clubhouse. Da, da, da. It's interesting how much money Spotify is spending, isn't it? They are really breaking the bank from the deals to sign Rogan, obviously the Call Her Daddy thing, um, the other deals that they've kind of thrown out to people, the Ringo and all that stuff. And now they've got this app. And if I'm assuming if it does become successful, they're going to sign some big deals with certain podcasters or hosts and whatnot. It's going to be... It's going to be mad the future isn't it going forward i wonder if they're going to branch into doing hardware it's a really interesting state of affairs really i've got to be honest really interesting state of affairs but yeah um green room is here another kind of nail in the coffin of clubhouse more often more likely than not but again stranger things have happened i wouldn't be surprised if they managed to kind of fly out of this like a phoenix and sort of figure out a solution that works best for them honestly i wouldn't be surprised um let's move on here this is this is old news but i thought i'd cover it anyway this is courtesy of hype it says sneaker store issues apology for destroying boxes to deter reselling so obviously there's an issue in sneaker you know in sneaker culture or in, with sneaker is that what would you call it sneaker culture now is it cringe to say that whatever there is a problem at the moment with i wouldn't say reselling is the issue it's more so a supply and demand thing i've always kind of bemoaned the fact that you know sneakers the sneaker industry is now what worth billions um everybody and their mother collects shoes to a certain extent you know people wear yeezys day in day out nothing special like that as it was previously um and if that's the case why don't those brands just make more of the shoes that people actually want to buy these limited edition shoes and just make them more readily available people then say oh no then you won't want you won't want them anymore but i just think the way to kind of there must be some sort of middle ground that allows people to actually want to wear their shoes and kind of still partake in this culture to get them and also maintain some level of scarcity. There must be a middle ground. I just think this situation we're in at the moment, which just hasn't changed, where certain stores get a certain allocation, people backdoor some pairs, um, pairs are gone before they even leave the factory, kids, you know, kids of flipping Nike executives are buying, you know, hundreds and hundreds of pairs of shoes on their mum's credit card and shit and reselling them for triple the price and all that stuff is mostly the fault of the actual sneaker brands themselves mainly nike is a kind of the main culprit of this sort of stuff right they've had a stranglehold on the sneaker scene for ages and they've not really wanted to let go and they've not really went to make any changes to appease the audience that they're trying to bleed dry with all these copious amounts of colorways and different limited edition models it's flipping a piss take which is why i say fuck nike i just buy my shit and don't suck anyone's dick because it's a waste of time and obviously that negatively affects people that just want to buy the shoes and wear them and then certain stores then decide to take up kind of matters into their own hands to kind of correct the system and it's not really their place to do so and if anything it just causes more issues right you just kind of have to work with what you have and i just think this is a really great example of just you know maybe trying to do a good thing your heart's in the right place but it just kind of falling flat and angering people and just kind of driving home the point that these brands are putting people in a position where they're kind of having to harass store members because they feel as if they have no real way of kind of getting the shoe that they want because of this stupid system at the moment where you have to enter a raffle right raffles when i was younger was a thing that you entered for you basically bought a raffle ticket when i was a kid kind of like a lottery ticket the, the the ticket itself was a nominal fee a pound 20p whatever and if you were lucky enough you might get something that was you know 100 times the value of the lottery ticket you bought that was what a raffle actually was not you buying a ticket in order to get the chance for you to spend money on a shoe that you want to wear and then more likely than not you don't get it that wasn't really what a raffle is but again i digress we continue it says it says here, yeah, um, last week, London-based sneaker retailer Offspring experimented with a new method to deter reselling for a release of the unclaimed sneakers from previous raffles. So I didn't even know this was a thing. Supposedly, there's an unclaimed selection of shoes that's kind of sitting at Offspring from releases that they have, obviously limited edition shoes that people don't go and collect. Of course, you know, I'm assuming when you go and do your raffle at most of these places, you put your size in and what you want, and then you get sent a text or an email to let you know that you've got a shoe um you've been lucky enough to you've been lucky to be selected to purchase a shoe that you want to buy and then some people just can't be bothered after all the hoopla or the stress of waking up and f5ing everywhere they're just like you know what fuck this i don't really need them which is you know what you should be doing because you know these guys are bending over the barrel and making you buy stuff that you don't need again and again and again and then i guess you know they have a surplus amounts of these shoes and for the most part I imagine most of these shoes are the ones that no one wants because in the stores that I've worked in if people don't collect the shoes that they've kind of been allocated 
or you know in a raffle then somebody else will just go and take them because you know they're limited edition shoe everyone wants it so it's unlikely you're going to have their stock of a shoe that everyone wants it's just not likely so so if there, it's limited edition shoes that didn't sell and then they can't get rid of them because they you know no one's going to buy them retail because they're they're designed in a way that would only appeal to a certain segment of people that like those kind of shoes cool so it continues clips circulating on social media show the offspring employees jumping on several shoe boxes and instagram story posted by offspring showing flattened boxes with the caption we don't wear boxes caught the attention of sneakers around the world the backlash to the experiment was now been forced to offspring to issue an official apology the apology post on instagram was that customers were alerted to the method to deter reselling that was done to ensure the fair release of the community noted so again it makes sense if the shoe is something it would make sense if it's a shoe somebody wanted but still i don't think our spring or stores should be in a position to tell people what they should do with the stuff that they buy with their hard-earned money right once i give you the money for the goods and you hand it over to me there is no conversations left there anymore you don't have any ownership on what i have i don't have any ownership on the money you have anymore maybe if i keep my receipt into the refunding it there's still a communication to be had but this idea that they can kind of it's pretty demeaning right it's quite it's like they're babying you and they're telling you where what and what you should be doing with your shoes and that's why i say i don't really have a problem with resellers i think if you're gonna go out and buy shoes and pay away through college or whatever it may be or ensure you got it you got a good kind of budget for weed and stuff i don't care do it but the issue mostly lies at the feet of the brands themselves the manufacturers of these shoes who are unwilling um to produce and kind of you know give the people the shoes that they want in the quantities that they're able to buy them in and to maybe put in better processes that allow stores to get a healthy amount of stock so that they can kind of feed their local community that's how it should be so you don't have you know sales assistants who are on seven quid an hour jumping on boxes and then having to you know d you know read death threats from people all around the world because they're jumping on boxes of shoes which is basically akin to spitting on shoes or something do you know what i mean it's just not on and of course um there's a video here where is it yeah there's a the video here or oh, from twitter let's play a bit of it don't get me wrong when i used to work in retail i used to do this as too when you'd kind of like if somebody especially if you worked in like a big shoe brand store there'd be a lot of foreign tourists who would just buy shoes and they wouldn't want to take the box with them and you'd kind of this would be part of the fun part of your day you had to kind of crush all the boxes and put them out into the recycling bins but in a sneaker store a limited edition one that sells kind of limited edition shoes this is real sacrilege really to be honest you're forcing people to what wear the shoes not have the boxes why have people want the boxes again i'm not really a fan of boxes i always been mine but some people want them for storage some people just want to have them for the having them sake and again you're not in the position to tell people how and what they should be doing with their items once they pay for it it's just bizarre to say the least <laughs> And it maybe just speaks again to the overall sense. I won't say entitlement, but this kind of weird kind of, um, you know, sometimes you get this weird vibe when you go into sneaker stores where they kind of feel as if like um, they're doing you a favor by selling you a shoe that they have no business in, that didn't make the, the, the design. It's just, you know what I mean? This kind of overinflated sense of self, you know? And I had it myself again, working in the sneaker store. I don't know what happens. Maybe because you work in a place where a lot of people want to work and you've got stuff that a lot of people want it kind of gives you this idea that you're somehow at this elevated position when you're just a sales assistant um no one at nike knows who you are no one cares who you are you're never going to get a job there for the most part right like it's just you but you have this idea that okay if i work here this is going to get me there, 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 there. maybe maybe but for the most part most people don't do you know what i mean and i've been in that position myself i know how kind of you know the games you have to you have to be a, you have to you have to be a flipping shark to make that work you have to be very strategic in what you do it takes a lot of planning it takes a, you know it's a lot of happenstance and luck and stuff involved in it so maybe that adds to it but there is a little bit of a hint in it but again they did apologize was the main thing so let's read their actual apology here it says here um which is signed well, i don't know what that's meant to show there like uh, reaching out to sneaker gods and saying i'm sorry i'm sorry with like a nondescript racial hand here i don't know what that means but hey we continue it says here offspring hq on instagram they apologize for that video and said here as most of you will now um will know we invest a lot of time in trying to get things right at offspring community latest shoes on what latest shoes on as many feet as possible our mission from its formation cool 
on this journey we have continued to break new ground and test new ideas and thoughts however crazy they may seem at the time our golden rule is that we listen to our community and welcome feedback good to know so we have reached many milestones that have helped to shape where we are today and we will always put our hands up when we get something wrong and we will strive to improve it on friday we experimented with a unique new way to deal with uncollected pairs of old raffle shoes and we offered them to our community in a safe fcfs way um, with a pair what with a fair one rule for all the rule is simple one pair in your size per person and no box again there are no box fingers like what are you doing um the reason for one person is obviously fair to our community and to spread out limited edition qual uh, quantity of desired styles while as possible the no box was to ensure that the item is available ready to wear and cannot be returned no it's to stop reselling which is nonsense the not returning thing you can just make sure it's just not returnable and you put that on the receipt i guess legally if somebody has a receipt they can always return something i think i've been in that position i retail myself but whatever this is explained to um this was explained to all the majority of people were happy but some were concerned about the value of the product minus the box and they chose not to purchase for this we want to apologize of course which is annoying isn't it? imagine going there and you can't get the box and it's like and they're just giving you the shoes in a plastic bag like what is this tj max it continues um for this we want to apologize what sounded like a good idea caused unnecessary controversy so we accept that we got this wrong we should have supplied the box fair play to them we won't do it again we accept the fcs the fcfs what's that first come first serve right um of high heat product high heat product honestly so whoever's writing this copy like find the nearest bridge and jump off it head first mate um will future be the via pre-arranged hatch appointments what's a pre-arranged hatch appointment like a hatch like a bin hatch do they chuck shoes at you in your face on carnival street like that we apologize for those customers who are offended by our actions and everything we try has always been for the betterment of our community. But we always try our best. We will never stop engaging and trying to find new and improved ways to serve our community. Just serve them the shoes, man. You don't need to find new and cool, interesting ways to sell shoes to people. The raffle's already gay as it is and annoying. Just sell the shoes, right? The whole thing is a farce. Um, this whole finding new ways to kind of connect the community is bullshit. For the most part, they're a fairly decent sneaker store anyway for the ones that we have here in London. People seem to vibe with them more. People seem to enjoy their shopping experience. There's a lot of kind of old school sneaker heads that still um, exist in those sort of stores and work there who do a great job. There's obviously a great little community of workers there, people that shop there, blah, de, blah, blah, blah. That's, the, that's as best as you can get. All this other kind of engineering, new processes to buy stuff, it's just so excessive and over the top says yeah but with the frustration with the decision we make it never justifies the actions of some who humiliate or threaten our staff on social media or in store the policies were not made by our staff and experiments are not driven by them that is neither the character nor spirit of our community and we abhor all such behavior but again you put them in that position didn't you you put them in that position front and center you empowered them to be quote unquote the arbitrators of who should be reselling and who shouldn't who gets a box and who doesn't so it's no surprise that people kicked off and decided to point their ire at the people who they saw in the videos because there's no i'm for sure those videos don't contain managers doing it right or people that are actually calling the shots were involved in that nonsense it's always the retail staff who are getting paid the less um who are getting paid you know what six seven quid or eight pound an hour are the ones that are being put front and center set front front and center sorry going too fast there and you know now they're in a position where they're having to kind of retract everything and apologize fair enough they apologize that's all a good thing but again this just goes to show the nonsense that surrounds sneaker culture and it's just a whole bunch of bullshit man people have kind of just accepted that these brands can go around not supplying demand not manufacturing shoes to kind of fulfill the demand that exists out there even though it's a billion dollar industry even though everybody in their nan knows what a dunk is has worn the yeezy and all that stuff it just isn't what it was before just make the shoes let people buy them and go from there i don't understand why you can buy an apple iphone as many times as you want um a, a new imac and stuff but you can't buy a limited pair of shoes a limited pair of flipping sakai ld waffles if you don't register and if you don't retweet a something and at your friend in a comment and all this sort of nonsense these sort of hoops you have to jump through and then don't get me started on the friends and family stuff you get seeing people you know you're seeing young lord and he's flipping fat tubby self wearing these disgusting outfits, wearing all these crazy Nikes that you're never going to be able to get. You see them wearing him. Fair enough, you think he looks cool. You save your money, you want to wear what he wears and then it comes out and you can't buy it. 
right? What's the point? Like, they just honey dick you. They show you all this stuff that you can't buy. See them to people who don't really appreciate the shoes because they get everything for free. Because that's imagine if I was young Lord and Ian Collin, these kind of people, and I was getting sent boxes of free tier zero Nike products, I probably would wear them the same way they're wearing them, right? With, you know, stupid, t you know, baggy, teared up jeans and tie dye shirts and, you know, doing the money fund everywhere I go. I'd probably do the same thing as well because why not? But then, when you want to wear them or when you want to purchase them as a regular civilian there is no route to do so because that shoe doesn't exist for the regular civilian there's no way to purchase that shoe because there's a limited friends and family on your release and even when the retail version does come out it's still limited to the point where the odds of you getting it are much better than you playing the lottery do you know what i mean it's just a nonsense system nonsense nonsense system and now you have again stores kind of in, trying to step in and be the arbitrators of who buys and who doesn't like come on man what are we doing here what uh what are we doing here as um the great brendan shaw says often anyway that is the excellent English episode number 469 i'm gonna leave it there for now it's been a bit too long been rabbing and ranting on if it's your first time check out the show via youtube you know what to do smash the like hit subscribe leave me a comment down below if you're listening via the podcast app a five star review and a share will help the show to go a long way and i'll see you guys again very very soon take care be safe Peace.